Good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dan Weld. Um, I'll, I'll take the next 15 minutes to introduce Dan. I've got a lot to say. Uh, you all know him. Every, well, everybody here pretty much knows Dan, mostly from his uh, long, distinguished AI career. So I thought I'd spend a few minutes talking about his work in databases that few, very few of you know about. Um, he did some work in databases as well. Actually, Dan has done work in so many fields in, of computer science. It's pretty amazing. Now he's into HCI and, and uh, stuff like that. So he's, he's quite uh, a very broad guy. Um, Dan comes from the University of Washington. He's an entrepreneur in his free time, or used to be an entrepreneur in his free time. Uh, he founded uh, um, NetBot and then uh, a very wonderful company called Nimble uh, a few years ago, 10 years ago, actually. Uh, he's a fellow of the AAAI, ACM, um, and, uh, um, and just a great guy. So I'll let him do the rest of the talking today. Thanks. Um, thanks, Alon. Uh, it's nice to see you've mellowed a little bit in your in your time, and thanks for not being quite so so candid. Although I did enjoy enjoy working on the database um, projects with you, and hope you'll come back to teach me some more. So I wanted to talk to you folks about the Intelligence and Wikipedia project, which is going on at UW. And as you can see from the uh, slide there, there's quite a few uh, people who've been working on it. But um, I wanted to highlight Fei Wu and Raphael Hoffman, who've been doing most of the work. Uh, in fact, I see that I'm supposed to, to put some pictures in there to tell you who they are. But uh, apparently, I, I forgot to do that. I was working on the talk last night in this uh, coffee shop, and they, they closed an hour earlier. So I finished the talk in my. Uh, rent a car in the parking lot, and it was a little awkward place to place to work. Um, so just before um, I start, today I'm going to be telling uh, you a little bit about some of the, the work having to do with the web, but uh, there's two other projects that I'm involved with quite a bit as well. One's collaborating with some folks at NASA Ames on automated planning, um, and the other one that Alon referred to just a second ago is on uh, intelligent user interfaces. So not too much talk about those in this talk, although there's a little bit about uh, the user interfaces. Um, so the motivating vision here is probably apple pie to you guys. Um, and it has to do with trying to make search uh, quite a bit smarter. And I guess uh, the premise behind um, our work is that we really need to have three additional components to make search smarter. One is information extraction. Another one is ontology. And the third is inference. And I hope after the talk you guys can tell me how, uh, how we're wrong on, on this. Um, but we're interested in trying to answer a wider variety of queries um, where there may not be a single web page that has the answer. So given uh, sort of a little toy query which German scientists taught at US universities, um, you might find some page that says Einstein was a German-born theoretical physicist. Another web page that said Einstein was a guest lecturer at the Institute for Advanced Study in New Jersey. Another page that says New Jersey is a state in the northeastern region of the United States. Put these together, and a human obviously knows that Einstein is an answer to that question. But can we make our search systems uh, come up with uh, those kinds of results as well? So um, coming back to the, to the, three, uh, the three main components, uh, information extraction, what we're imagining is being able to go out and crawl over these uh, web pages and extract tuples um, from the natural language text there. Um, we also want to build a taxonomy, for example, realizing things like physicists or subclasses of scientists. And finally, we want to be able to do inference to put all these facts together. And one key component there is realizing that Einstein referred on one page to the same individual as, uh, as Einstein in another page. Um, and furthermore, we want to do this at web scale. And uh, so while self-supervised, uh, sorry, while um, fully supervised machine learning works fine for information extraction, in many cases it doesn't uh, work if we want to scale this to the um, many thousands of, of relations uh, that uh, we need to, uh, to get to sort of encompass human knowledge. OK, so our premise is that what we should do um, is start with Wikipedia. And uh, there's quite a few reasons why. One is it's a comprehensive uh, information source. Um, it's high quality. Um, and most importantly, there's a lot of useful structure that makes it much easier to extract information uh, from Wikipedia than uh, from the web as a whole. So one key thing is every important concept um, or entity has its own unique identifier, which is the URL of the page describing that on Wikipedia. And whenever another, another article refers to that entity, typically it links to 
to that page giving you uh, a unique reference. Um, another uh, very important fact is notion of info boxes. And just out of curi curiosity, how many people know what an info box is? Um, OK, well, I'll give an example in just a second. Um, there's also category and, uh, and list uh, entities on, on Wikipedia, which give sort of rudimentary tagging information. In fact, this, no this information is really noisy, so it's not as helpful as we would like. There's also a bunch of other structure. For example, every Wikipedia article, the first sentence is very stylized and tells you an awful lot about uh, the object being talked about. Redirection pages are a source of synonyms. Disambiguation pages um, are also useful for, uh, for doing co-reference. Um, finally, uh, although about 25% uh, of the pages on Wikipedia are in English, in fact, there's over 200 different languages. And if you just focus on the top 10 to 15 most popular languages, you find that m much of the most important content is written in several different languages. And we believe we can harness uh, uh, the sort of the correspondence between uh, the pages in those different languages to do extraction with a higher precision. And then finally, uh, there's a revision history. So every change made to Wikipedia gets recorded. And by looking not just at the current version of the page, but how the page has changed over time gives us quite a bit of important information about it. So it would be nice to be able to do complete extraction from the web. And in fact, um, what we believe is if we can learn to do extraction and get a lot of information out of Wikipedia, we can then use that to bootstrap ourselves to the web. I'll come back to that point a little bit later in the talk. but. We argue it's much, much simpler uh, to do it from Wikipedia uh, to start with. OK, and then there's a whole bunch of things that make this difficult. One, it's natural language text. Two, even though it's high quality, there's a lot of missing data and inconsistencies. And most importantly, there's low redundancy. So quite a few um, strategies for doing information extraction rely on the fact that any given fact is repeated out there on the web many, many, many different times. And uh, that's not really true in Wikipedia itself, because most things are, are stated once and just, and just once. OK, so here's an outline for the talk. First, I want to tell you about our self-supervised extraction scheme. Um, then I want to talk about automatic taxonomy generation and talk about probabilistic inference, how we can take these things and put them all together. And this is sort of the outline for the talk. As you'll see, I'll be skipping around a teensy bit, uh, but I'll come back to this slide to, to try to orient you. OK, so I'm going to start by talking about uh, the self-supervised extraction. And the cornerstone of the idea there is to train on info boxes. Um, so let me motivate that. So with traditional supervised information extraction, we use supervised learning. So we start out with raw data, and uh, we get labels for those uh, pieces of data. For information extraction, we might have a sentence saying, currently-based Microsoft is the largest software company. And since we're interested in the relation headquarter of a company in a city, we would label the sentence with, uh, there's a uh, a city name and, sorry, a company name and a city name and so on. And we could use that as a training example. We also have a bunch of negative examples saying uh, that that sentence doesn't have any information about uh, that particular relation. So we take that training data, we feed it to our learning algorithm when we get uh, in an extractor. And the problem is, where do we get the labeled training data? It takes a large amount of work. And um, in our case, we don't want to even fix ourselves to a fixed set of relations at the beginning. So if we, have an, if we want to be able to handle sort of an unbounded number of relations, how the heck are we going to get this training data? We certainly don't want to go out there and ask people to do it. So is there some other way? And um, our technique is basically to use heuristics to generate a noisy training set. So our heuristics um, come from this particular Wikipedia structure. So what we want to do is go from info boxes to a training set. And it's very simple. So most. <coughs> um, Many, many different uh, articles in Wikipedia have what's called an info box. Here's a little picture of one. It typically occurs in the upper right-hand side of the page. It's a little tabular display of the key attributes um, with the relevant values for that article. So here we have an article on Clearfield County, Pennsylvania. And we find out what the population is, when it was founded, uh, what the land area is, and a bunch of, uh, a bunch of other things like that. And by doing a, a simple heuristic match, uh, we can see, um, OK, well, the value of of the date that this county was founded is 1804. And we can find that in a sentence. And if we can find a unique sentence in the article, we can um, automatically mark it up and say, well, that's probably a positive training instance for the relation which corresponds to this attribute um, of this class. So in this case, the class um, is US county. And uh, we've got a bunch of different attributes. So those are our relations. And we get our training data. 
So pretty straightforward. There's a couple challenges. One is this inconsistency. So sometimes we're going to miss uh, training examples because uh, you know somebody updated the language, the natural language text, without updating the info box or vice versa. Um, also, you can see there's cases here. We got 28.2 kilometers squared as opposed to 28 kilometers squared in the info box. So there's a number of um, you know a little challenges to make this whole approach work. But the basic idea is pretty straightforward. Um, so taking that idea, um, the, uh, the initial Kylin system um, basically has two parts, a preprocessor and um, some classifiers and other kinds of learning algorithms. So we go from Wikipedia. We refine the schemata. So we go through Wikipedia pages, and we say, oh, it looks like there's a lot of pages that have a US-county uh, info box class in them. So that's an interesting um, class of entities. And now let's look at the attributes. And it turns out that the different county pages, some of them have some attributes, some of them have other attributes. Some attributes are only used on one or two pages. Um, and so uh, the first thing we do is figure out what the relations that are are mentioned frequently enough that we're going to try to learn them. And then we use that heuristic idea that I just described to, uh, to build this training data set. And then uh, we're going to learn these classifiers and the extractor. Um, so how many, every, I'm giving this talk a couple other places. I assume everybody knows precision and recall. So uh, why don't we skip right through that. And I'm just going to be talking about the area under the precision recall curve as the measure that we're, we're interested in measuring. So. Um, and my apologies. I am going to talk a little bit more about the classifier in this document. So one thing we're going to do is we're going to learn a document classifier. And that is for every, we want to be able to see every document that comes through. We want to be able to predict what kind of info box class it would be. If it has an info box, of course, it's easy. So we're interested in the pages that don't have info boxes in them yet because we essentially want to extract the information that would let us build an info box. Secondly, for every sentence, we want to be able to predict um, which attribute might be uh, might have its value described in that sentence. Um, and so, uh, if we've got you know n info box classes, we need to learn n document classifiers. If there's k uh, attributes per info box class, we need to learn k n um, sentence classifiers. And then for each document class and attribute, we need to learn um, an extractor. And we're going to use conditional random fields for that. OK, so pass the stuff. Um, so that basic idea, and there's a bunch of details I'm sweeping under the rug because I want to get onto some of the more new material. That, uh, that basic idea worked really quite well. And on popular classes like US County or University or uh, a number of, um, of other ones, we got um, some great, uh, great precision as high as 98, a little over 98%. Um, and the recall was pretty reasonable too, up to, to you say, 95%. Uh, uh, depending on the attributes. Certain types of attributes were harder than others. Um, so we were incredibly excited, and we published the paper. And it was only afterwards we uh, came to sort of the obvious conclusion, which is this works great. But actually, um, in the classes where you don't have quite as many existing info boxes, the whole idea doesn't work so well. And unfortunately, looking a little bit more carefully, there's a long tail behavior. So pretty much all of the classes uh, don't have very much training data. So 40% uh, of the info box classes have less than 10 info boxes in them. And it's pretty hard to train with, um, with 10 training examples, even if, uh, especially if you're generating them heuristically. So if we want to really be able to cover uh, a wide variety of, of knowledge here, we need to come up with a different scheme. So a natural scheme to use is shrinkage. So in particular, if we're interested in the info box class performer, um, there aren't very many instances of performer. But if we knew that performers were a subclass of person and actors were a subclass of performer, then we might be able to use the training data we have for actors and the training data we have for people to, to help us learn um, how to extract the different relations of performer. In particular, they probably still have a birth, you know, probably all have a birth date and they probably all have a, a spouse relation and so on. Um, and the problem is that Wikipedia wasn't really engineered by anybody. And so each of these uh, schemata uh, really, uh, they don't line up naturally. And so one thing we need to do is we need to have this taxonomy, which Wikipedia doesn't have for us. And we also need to have, be able to match uh, the attributes of each of the classes together. But if we had that, we could do shrinkage, and it would be great. So coming back to the outline, what I want to do is talk about how we automatically generated uh, a taxonomy like this. And then I'll show how we were able to improve our recall enormously using shrinkage. So here is the architecture of um, our COG system, which appeared in WWW last spring. 
And again, we use a very similar schema cleaning approach. And then we try to detect ISA relations. And the basic idea is to build, um, is to use Markov logic uh, networks to do a big you know, joint uh, inference uh, problem. And we're going to try to determine when we've got a subsumption relation at the same time that we're trying to map the various classes into um, corresponding WordNet classes. Uh, and then after we've done that, then the next phase is to do a schema mapping uh, where we match up the relevant attributes for the parent-child classes. And focusing on that for a second, um, Basically, we treat it as a binary classification problem. And the, the interesting part here is in the features, and we use lots and lots and lots of features. Going into them in detail um, is pretty darn uh, tedious. So there's sort of the obvious string features and information retrieval methods. Uh, there's a mapping to WordNet. Uh, we also use what I call Hearst patterns, which is basically looking um, using web search results to uh, come up with uh, matches to phrases like, you know, X is a city, um, you get information about uh, uh, classes and subclass relationships by, by doing that, um, as talked both in Marty Hurst's original paper and also the, the know-it-all work done at UW. Um, and then actually one of the most important uh, features is comes from this revision history that WordNet has. So it turns out you might have an article on Albert Einstein, and it turned out initially he was uh, you know, when the info boxes first came around, somebody may have created a scientist info box class, um, and Einstein might have been a scientist info box class. And then later, it got changed, and, and the class of, uh, of Einstein's info box got changed to physicist, um, and so on. And when you see that kind of a, a change in the, in the revision history, it gives you a strong clue that um, scientists and physicists um, um, are closely related. You would think that things always get specialized, but in fact, just as often, they move the other direction. But it certainly is a strong clue that there's a parent-child relationship, even if you don't, um, even if you don't get a, a completely perfect signal on which one's the parent and which one's the child. I guess the other thing you might expect would be that the number of attributes would sort of be strictly growing as you go down in the taxonomy. And that also turns out not to be true. Nevertheless, there's a huge amount of, of signal in these features. And so uh, uh, setting up the learning algorithm, we actually looked at a couple different learning algorithms. But um, I'm not going to go into the details there. We're able to learn uh, this nice, nice taxonomy. Um, Oh, so sorry, here I'm going through and illustrating that example of, of uh, using the, the revision history. And again, we used um, an SVM. We also did this joint inference, and that worked better. So skipping past those results, let me talk about the schema mapping. So here we did a little bit more of a quick and dirty job. Um, and uh, basically, we have a bunch of heuristics. So uh, looking at the edit history and also sing string similarity um, gives us a huge amount of clue. We've got basically three rules. We apply them in order, and that tells us how to match up, uh, to match up the, uh, the attributes in the, different, in the different schemata. And overall, the approach works really quite well. Our precision was 94 percent, our recall was 87 percent, um, and so um, the final taxonomy we generate um, is, really, uh, is really pretty good. Um, in fact, what we'd really like to do is instead of first learning the subsumption relations and then going on and trying to do the schema mapping, it makes sense to do both of those at the same time in a joint way. And so that's one of the things that we're working on right now, uh, the problem being, of course, getting the whole thing to scale. Yeah? The, um, the precision recall numbers, those are on a um, map, on, on a link per link evaluation, or is that? Yeah, that's on a link per link evaluation. Um, to be honest, I can't remember whether it's just looking at the subsumption, at the ISA relations. I think it's just looking at the ISA relations as opposed to the schema mapping as well. But that also worked quite well, as long as you got the ISA relation right. Other, other questions? OK. Um, so now that we've got this ontology, let me come back and show how we can use it for, for shrinkage. And uh, the basic idea, there's really only, once you've got the ontology, the real question is, how do you actually weight um, the examples from related classes? Um, and we considered a number of different approaches, including uh, trying to weight the fact that if you've got lots of data, then that's good, or trying to look at what your confidence was in the parent-child relationship and giving a higher weight if that worked. We also tried looking at. Um, 
the extractor, suppose we've learned some extractors for actor, we could actually try them on the 44 examples to see how well those extractors are working on the corresponding, uh, on the corresponding attribute of performer. And if they work really well, then we could weight these examples, you know, much higher. And we tried a bunch of those different things. And to be honest, it didn't really matter um, all that much. Um, uh, but the net effect was, and I'll show you a a, an experimental graph in just a minute, the overall effect was it, it really worked um, extremely well. Um, but since I'm giving an overview talk, I want to talk about this next technique we did as well, and it's called retraining. Um, and the basic idea is that when you're learning just on Wikipedia text, oftentimes the Wikipedia pages are quite stylized. And one example would be um, an article on Albert Einstein it would say something like Albert Einstein parentheses, and then it would give one year dash another year parentheses. You know, is a you know physicist or something like that. Um, and our system, given a bunch of training examples like that, quickly realizes that uh, if you've got the first sentence and you've got two things that look like dates inside parentheses with a dash between them, then probably you can get the the birth date and the death date that way. And since that's the way birth date and, and um, appears typically in Wikipedia pages, you tend not to get any training examples that say, you know, Joe Blow was born in 1960. And so if you later find a page where it said that, we're going to have trouble, trouble extracting that. So with retraining, what we do um, is we take the extractions from Kai Lin with ones that were generated by TextRunner. So this is a system by Oren Etzioni and his um, colleagues. And I'm guessing that many people here know about how TextRunner works. Can I see hands uh, on TextRunner? How many people don't know what TextRunner is? Um, OK, so TextRunner um, is also interested in a very similar problem to, to what we're interested in. Um, it's, uh, Oren likes to call it open information extraction. So again, going out and extracting information off of the web without actually trying to provide, without providing any training data for the specific relations. But instead of using the self-supervised learning approach that we do with Wikipedia to come up with, to automatically build a training set for each relation, what he does instead um, is, uh, is looks for grammatical patterns that are independent of any relation. Um, so you might say subject, verb, object. Um, in a case like that, you can sort of extract a tuple where the verb denotes the relation, and the subject and the object are the arguments of those, of those tuples. He's got a number of other patterns like that. He's able to learn them off of the Wall Street Journal uh, corpus. And then he, uh, or rather Michelle Banco, um, also has built a CRF extractor, which just goes for those high-level patterns of this is probably a relation here. And it extracts the relation as one of the arguments. So it's a very different approach, but it's tackling a similar problem. So, uh, and, and the main benefits, I'll come back to this a little bit later. One of the main benefits of, uh, of the text runner approach is it's you know, very, very general. One of the weaknesses is um, can they get their precision um, as high as an approach uh, like ours? So what we're interested in doing is taking those tuples um, so they might find some sentence out there that says Albert Einstein was born, you know, on, does anybody know when he was born? Uh, I'll say 1960, because that's when I was born. Um, so Albert Einstein was born in 1960. Um, and what uh, we do is we basically look at the extractions that we've found um, and that we've taken as our training data off of the info boxes. And we look at the things that the similar kinds of tuples that uh, the text runner has learned. Um, and when they match, uh, then what we're able to do is get that sentence that text runner used for its extraction and take that as a new positive example um, for our training set of a relation-specific extractor. If they don't match, we throw it away. Um, so by doing that, by sort of looking at the sentences the text runner was able to extract the same kind of thing as we've extracted, um, we get more positive examples of sentences, and they're labeled. And also, um, we're able to, uh, to get rid of some sentences that we had been assuming were negative training examples previously. Um, and so we can get rid of those. So retraining basically lets us augment the training data we're using when training our relation-specific extractors. Um, so if you combine those two techniques, shrinkage and retraining, 
um, then here's what we get. So uh, over here, here's the performance of Kylan's extractor um, using the base technique on the Irish newspaper class. And after applying shrinkage and retraining, you can see that the area under the precision recall curve is, I don't know, what, 5,000 times better. And down here, uh, you can see that uh, on the writer class, uh, Kylan did better. But if you apply shrinkage and retraining, um, then we still get a big improvement to the area under the precision recall curve. So what's the difference? Well, in Writer, we had 2,000 uh, info box instances that we could use for our training set. For Irish newspapers, uh, we only had 20. Um, and so Kylan wasn't able to do very well with just those info box instances. And that's really where shrinkage helps enormously. So. Uh, uh, and here, what are we doing? We're shrinking uh, from, from newspaper, for general newspapers. Now, should there be an Irish newspaper class? I don't know, but uh, the people who built Wikipedia thought there should be. Um, so we get a 14% improvement in the area under the precision recall curve in a very, very popular class. And we get um, you know, a much bigger improvement on a sparse class, sort of what you would expect. In any case, um, it's, uh, it's a great improvement. Now, the thing, that's, uh, the thing that's especially good is by having these retrained extractors, we can do a lot, uh, a lot more on them. So what I want to do now is show you how we're able to bootstrap uh, this technology and apply it to extraction from the broader web. And why do we do that, uh, given that I went on about how great Wikipedia is uh, you know, with, what, 2.6 million articles in the English language and so on? Well, it turns out um, that 44% of uh, the articles in Wikipedia are stub articles. They're labeled with the keyword stub, which basically means somebody created them, but there isn't you know, enough text there yet. And so even if we had a 100% perfect extractor, if we run our extractor on that text, the chances are it's not going to have the data value we want, and we're not going to be able to extract it. Um, so what we'd like to be able to do um, is go out to the web, especially for those pages, but in general, and be able to find uh, the right attribute values. In fact, we could then go back and sort of start writing, uh, autonomously writing the Wikipedia article. Um, so what do we do? Well natural approach is to take our favorite search engine and, um, and use that. And we issue a query um, that's composed of the title. Uh, we actually tried a number of different strategies here again. But uh, the basic idea is you issue uh, a search engine query with the title of the article and um, some keywords that we found tend to uh, correspond to the attribute we're interested in. And again, we can't just take the info box attribute name because that's usually some sort of gibberish that looks more like computer code. Um, however, in our retraining process, we've been able to find out what kinds of words tend to go with the birth date attribute. And so we would have discovered at that point that born in um, is a key phrase that we oftentimes see around, uh, around birth dates. So uh, we would issue a query that would look like something like, quote, Albert Einstein, unquote, quote, born in, unquote. And then we'd get back some pages. So the challenges are, how do we maintain high precision? The pages can be noisy out there. And furthermore, in contrast to Wikipedia, many of the web pages out there, we might come back with a web page, which is a great source of information, but it's not just talking about Albert Einstein. It's talking about you know, all Nobel Prize winning physicists. And so if we're not careful, we'll extract somebody else's birth date. And this is a key, a key challenge. Again, it's the fact that we're training on stylistically very, very uh, simple pages on Wikipedia where each article is typically about one topic, and now we got into the web, we have to worry about that. Um, and then finally, we have to figure out how do we want to extract this. When do we know that we're confident enough about something we extract from the web that we uh, believe it's more, uh, more likely than anything we've extracted from the Wikipedia page? Um, so the key, the key solutions here are, one, make a very, very specific query to send off to the search engine. And two, be very careful about where you extract when you get that page back. Make sure you find you extract only from a paragraph that seems to be very likely about the target. Um, without going into the details there that you can see if you want in our KDD paper, um, you can see uh, I mean, this, again, is actually sort of a, a recap of the previous slide with a new, slightly more exciting color that shows the benefit of shrinkage and retraining. Um, 
And now you can see how, able, how well we're able to do when we bootstrap to the web. So these are using the extractors trained on Wikipedia, generalized with retraining, and now applied to the web. And the thing that's really interesting is um, where shrinkage and retraining didn't really help on the writer class before because of all the examples, it turns out still that there's um, a lot of articles about writers on Wikipedia or about pages that we know uh, that our, our classifiers determine are about writers where uh, once we got to the web, we can actually find extra information which we could bring back and create a new info box, for example. So we get benefit uh, on weirdo pages, weirdo classes like Irish newspapers, but also really mainstream classes. Um, so, and, and I guess, again, I'm not showing you all the experiments we did. If you try to do extraction from the web without doing shrinkage and retraining, it just doesn't work at all. So it's really important to do first shrinkage, then retraining, and then, uh, and then, and only then try to go out and bootstrap to the web. Okay, so we were really excited, and um, actually we were excited before we got the most recent results, and we figured, great, we're doing extraction from Wikipedia. Now what we really need to do is close the loop. We'll go back and automatically create new info boxes um, on, on Wikipedia. And so we wanted to do things right, and so we checked, and there's, of course, a, a bot policy on Wikipedia that tells you exactly what you need to do to hook your software agent up to uh, uh, to Wikipedia to make contributions on its own, and we, you know, sent in uh, a very careful application talking about what a great scientist I am and how dedicated and loyal we are and our impressive precision and recall results, and we got a very prompt response back from them saying, absolutely no way. Um, and in particular, the response says, who are you? You haven't made any contributions to Wikipedia. How do I know you're not a jerk? Um, which, of course, I said, I could have hooked up my robot without asking you, but um, anyway, the, the response was from a, uh, you know, a Wikipedia master, uh, grandmaster, whatever the title is. Anyway, he's a 14-year-old Finnish boy. Um, and so this was a big blow to my self-esteem, but uh, we realized that uh, you know, we couldn't just go back and put these things, because even if we've got 90% precision, that's not quite good enough to put back into, into Wikipedia. Yeah? Are you in Wikipedia? What? Are you in Wikipedia? Uh, me personally? Um, no, every time somebody tries to add me to Wikipedia, I revert it. <laughs> or maybe he's reverting it, I don't know. But yeah, you guys, please put me in there. <laughs> um, I think Kai Lin is, but, uh, but not me. Okay, so we realized that 90% precision is just not high enough to go in there. And so we really need to have, I mean, we could try to get our machine learning better and better and better, but as you guys all know, that's, you know, it's hard to, to push. Uh, at those last few percentage points of, of, uh, of error. And so it seems much more natural. Why not get, uh, why not get people involved? And while the, this Finnish kid wanted me to, to do it, I realized that that wasn't scalable. And so what we'd really like to do is get um, other people involved. So how can we improve precision with people? And here's the vision. So what we'd like to do, um, and let me take a step backwards. I think what's really interesting is that the internet has enabled two technologies for large scale uh, construction of structured information. One's obviously information extraction, and you guys know there's lots of success stories there. Another one is uh, community content creation, Wikipedia, Amazon reviews, and, uh, and all sorts of other things are good examples there. But there's been very little work on how to put these two together. And it really seems as if you should be able to create a synergistic feedback cycle. So, what we like to do is um, use information extraction to create quality pages. If you've got quality pages, then the traffic coming to those pages is going to increase. When people come, as long as you can get them to make edits, that improves the content, which drives more traffic. But also, those edit improves the training data, which you can then use to make information extraction algorithms better. So what we wanted to do is to try to, uh, to see if we could uh, get this feedback loop going. Um, and this leads us to the HCI portion of the talk. Um, basically, what we're interested in is trying to foster contribution as a non-primary task. So of course, lots of people have been out there trying to build power tools for Wikipedia editors um, to make it so that it's easier for them to, to, to edit things. But what we like to do is make it much easier uh, for you know Joe Average person who's coming to make a contribution to, uh, to Wikipedia. So we like to encourage these contributions without annoying people. <coughs> and we built five different interfaces. And we ran a rather um, unique study to, uh, to try to see how well 
they work. So here um, is uh, an illustration of one of our interfaces. So if uh, some person who's just coming, not trying to edit or anything, but just coming to check out Ray Bradbury, um, they, uh, and they hover over one of these buttons, um, then we pop up a little interface that says, we think that the summary um, over here should say that Ray Bradbury's birthplace was a Waukegan. Is this what the article says? And then the user you know, can see that as highlight up there. And they can say yes, you know, or they can just click the bloody thing because they're irritated at us. Um, and we tried a number of different interfaces. And we try, we had to vary the interfaces a number of ways because the first ones uh, that we wrote, we discovered people were misunderstanding. And again, we have a whole Kai submission on this. And I can only give you the, 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 uh, the high level um, version, of, uh, version of this. Um, uh, but we also did a survey afterwards to find out whether people were understanding, and we took metrics and showed uh, exactly how, uh, how much people were, were contributing. And the interesting part of our thing is what we want to do is we want to get um, casual users who are not part of any study um, just to see if they would actually contribute while they're engaged in their primary task, which in this case presumably is reading about Ray Bradbury. So we can't just go and hire college sophomores and ask them to come into our lab. We really need to get people in the middle of this primary activity. And so what we did, and it really wasn't intended as charity to you guys, is uh, we bought a bunch of AdWords. Um, and we popped up little ads like this anytime somebody did a search on Ray Bradbury or uh, any of the other 20,000, uh, sorry, 2,000 articles about authors, uh, we would pop something like that. If somebody clicked on our ad, we gave you a pile of money. Um, and they came and saw our little mirror version of Wikipedia, which, just to be clear, also told them that it wasn't really Wikipedia and explained the details of the study if they were interested, although uh, they didn't usually do it. And we had JavaScript to pop up these interfaces. And we went through a bunch of different interfaces, those being the primary four. And we did some variations on that. And we tracked the clicks and the loads and did the survey, as I said before. And the net assumption, I can say, uh, sort of one of the main conclusions out of this talk is that um, you guys are making a lot of money, because I know my grant budget went way, way, way down on this. Um, <laughs> And somehow, mysteriously, the price kept on rising for Ray Bradbury. I really didn't think that Ray Bradbury was such a popular, a popular, popular thing. But uh, maybe the market was turning away from mortgages towards towards science fiction authors. OK, here's what we found. We came up with a bunch of different interfaces. In some sense, you can think about them in terms of this efficient frontier, where the x-axis is how obtrusive they are. And this is, uh, I haven't really put the units here, but it's a Likert scale um, that comes back from the survey results. And then on the y-axis, we see um, how likely they are to contribute. And I'll just point out, um, in fact, out of, I don't know, maybe showed about 800 people our baseline interface, the ordinary Wikipedia interface. Absolutely no one tried to contribute uh, based on that. Um, although you can also just sort of look in terms of how many people who go to Wikipedia actually contribute. And there it's about 1.6%. But presumably a lot of people who are going to Wikipedia directly are actually going uh, because they want to contribute. And that is why you're getting that 1.6 rate, which is higher than our 0% our rate. But people who are going to Wikipedia as a result of a search seem to be doing a lot less contribution. Nevertheless, we were able to get up to 13%. And uh, actually, I think we were able to get higher than that with uh, one of the more annoying interfaces. But with uh, the, revi the pop-up interface, the revised icon interface, we had 13%. And then furthermore, we were able to take the training data uh, that we got from, from people who were correcting things. And we went back and used that uh, improved training data to retrain our extractors. And sure enough, uh, the precision and recall of our extractors went up as well. So we demonstrated, I think, both sides of that feedback cycle. One, we get the contribution rate up higher. And two, we're also able to get uh, our extractors working better. And there's a lot more to say about the community side. If people are interested in talking about uh, how this fits into community organizations, Wikipedia, et cetera, I can talk about that. But let me come back to the final part of the talk. And this is uh, probabilistic inference. And uh, this is uh, just a, a quick couple slides from uh, Steph Schoemaker's uh, talk um, at EMNLP uh, a week ago. So the high-level idea is we want to be able to do inference. We want to take 
information that's been extracted from different pages and use that to answer questions. And we use a kind of knowledge-based model construction. So um, we have a set of inference rules specified, kind of like data log uh, rules. Uh, these drive off of a set of knowledge bases. Some of those knowledge bases are extractions. We also use a knowledge base which corresponds to WordNet. Um, and we do the sort of backward chaining inference to create a proof tree. We prune the proof, the proof tree and we use that to generate a Markov logic uh, network, so a, an undirected probabilistic model. And then we do probabilistic inference over that to estimate the probabilities of um, various tuples, in particular the tuple that somebody was asking questions about. And the result of our probabilistic inference is a set of answers. And depending on time, we can go around this loop a couple times doing lazy inference to get more and more answers. So uh, there's basically eight uh, logical rules, so not very many rules. Each one, like they tend to, to say things like certain predicates are transitive and so on. So we're taking very, very simple kinds of inference. And uh, we ran, uh, ran this on about 100 million uh, tuples that, uh, that we extracted from TextRunner. And so there's two points to make. One is actually we do get uh, a fair improvement in terms of the number of questions we can answer correctly. Uh, so roughly doubling the area under the pre precision recall curve. Um, and <coughs> the interesting thing is that the speed of this process appears to be about linear in the size of the corpus. Um, so we ran an experiment, you know, basically giving it increasing sections of, of the tuples, and you can see with these uh, correlation coefficients um, that the overall time taken by uh, Holmes, the inference system, is, is uh, basically linear in the size of the corpus. So that's pretty cool, but that sort of surprised us because we expected uh, that it would be more like n squared because, um, uh, you know, well, that, that's the worst case. So the question is why... Um, why aren't we getting this sort of higher order polynomial blow up? And you can look at a query, you know, uh, give me all the people who were married to somebody who lived in a particular place. And um, the question really is how big is that join going to be? And in general, of course, the join could be n squared. And if you've got more tuples or more inference rules, it can be a higher order polynomial. But when do you get that worst case? You get the worst case when you get some person, Y prime, who happened to be married to everyone and lived in every single place. And that typically doesn't, doesn't happen. Um, and so looking at that a little bit more, if we look at the sort of married relation, you know, again, we get kind of a long tail distribution. And there are some problematic cases here. Um, but uh, they're in the minority. And most everybody is, is down here. So the thing that's nice is we can characterize uh, the cases where if um, the distribution of our tuples in terms of how many matches they have once you fix one argument or the other argument, um, uh, if you look at that distribution and that distribution obeys certain, uh, certain parameters, then we're guaranteed that inference is going to be linear. And in the simplest case, you've got a functional relationship. If everybody's married to one and only one person, then that's very, very easy. And we call it pseudo-functional if there's some bound, um, which maybe is a function of y, that says how many people uh, a given person is married to. And then we basically say, well, what we're really interested in is approximal, approximately pseudo-functional uh, relations, where most of the relations are bounded by some small constant. And the number of bad apples or bad spouses, if you will, um, uh, really uh, are, are very rare. So basically, if you've got uh, at most log, log of those marriage relationships, then you're going to be OK. And so we've got a theorem saying, if this is the case, um, if, that mo if your relations are approximately pseudo-functional, then we can do inference in linear time. And we think that that captures uh, the sort of phenomenon where we saw that we, in fact, did get uh, uh, linear time behavior. And sure enough, you can go out there, and most of the relationships are um, are approximately pseudo-functional. OK, so uh, there's a large amount of related work. And I'm not going to try to go into all of it. I do want to point out um, the text runner system, which I mentioned earlier, done by uh, Michelle Banco, her PhD thesis, and, and Oren, and uh, collaborators, that takes this very different approach of trying to learn um, structural techniques. <coughs> There's another system done at Rochester called KNEX, which does a similar, a similar kind of a thing for a more expressive uh, intermediate form than the kinds of uh, three tuples that we uh, extract and that Oren's group extracts. 
Um, and then there's uh, other systems which you can sort of view in the light of um, unsupervised information extraction that extract large numbers of tables. And of course, preceding this work, there was a lot of work. Some we did, some with you can think about in terms of uh, Google Sets that extracts large numbers of lists. And these also um, can be seen as a kind of uh, unsupervised information extraction. Skip over this stuff for now. Skip over this stuff for now. And let me uh, talk just very briefly about the conclusions and then spend a minute on future work. So what I did is start out by talking about self-supervised extraction from Wikipedia, where we use the info boxes to bootstrap. And then we use shrinkage and retraining um, to, uh, to get us better precision recall so that we can go out and do web extraction. Talked about how people are essential to getting the, um, the precision up high and how we can maybe do that for free. Talked about generating these taxonomies and probabilistic inference. So, um, so I think one of the most interesting things uh, to do going forward and one that we're thinking about a lot is trying to take a step back and look at these different approaches to open information extraction. So we advocated this relational specific approach. And if you think that there's um, on the order of 5,000 different info box classes in Wikipedia, and each info box class has uh, approximately 10 or more attributes, um, our approach should be capable of learning about 50,000 relations, which is not unbounded, but it's an awful lot of relations and presumably quite comprehensive. On the other, on the other hand, uh, there's other approaches to open informa information extraction which take a very different approach, a structural approach. They don't try to learn any specific relation, but they try to extract the relation type as well. And what do they do? They look at, at different kinds of, of structure in the system. So systems like Knext and TextRunner look at grammatical structure. Um, then there's also approaches that go out and look for a DOM structure. You can look for table structure or list structure. And these are all different ways of extracting um, uh, you know, relational information, but in a very, very different way from the relation specific. So I think the really interesting question is, how do we combine these two techniques? And our retraining method is one first step at that, and it gave us a lot of, uh, a lot of power, but we're, we're interested in trying to combine uh, these in, in different ways going forward. So in particular, it seems like the rational approach um, has much greater precision, um, but this approach has greater just generality. So how do we combine those? Another thing that I didn't have time to talk about, we have a wisdom paper coming up talking about multilingual extraction. I alluded to this. You've got pages in different languages and exploiting, trying to do the extraction simultaneously or jointly in different languages gives you a lot of leverage. This is just the first step there. There's lots more to be done. Um, uh, I talked about how we learned this taxonomy and how um, uh, we did it in a pipeline way, first learning the ISA relations and then learning the schemata, schema mapping. And clearly, one should do that jointly. There's lots of other uh, information sources out there that you could bring into the mix. Um, and of course, lots of work on uh, schema matching and, and, and so on in the database community that we need to, to take into account. Um, and again, the key, the key challenge here is going to be scalability. Um, and then the final thing I'll talk about, and this is something that uh, my student Raphael Hoffman is working on right now, is trying to come up with uh, a sort of a better set of features to do information extraction in the first place. So if we look at what kinds of structures a CRF generates, if we've got training data like this, you build a CRF and it's basically using, obviously uses grammatical features and whether you've got capitalized words and, and part of speech tags and so on. But a lot of what's going on is learning you know, that Swedish tends to indicate a nationality, for example. And um, as a result, uh, we're not really generalizing very well. So what we'd really rather have, you know, when we test on data like this, you know, structurally is very similar, but we may not do so well. What we'd really like to have is, um, you know, a feature that says if uh, is that word on the list of occupations or is it on the list of nationalities or something like that. Much more high-level features. So the key question is, where do we get those lists from? And uh, and so what we've done is mine lists from the web in an approach very similar to the stuff that we did much earlier with list extraction and know-it-all and uh, what Google Sets does and, of course, similar to uh, the stuff Mike Caffarella has done in terms of extracting tables. So we've got a set of 55 million lists. And now the interesting thing is how do you come up with uh, the, right, uh, the right features? So we're given a set of seeds that come from the ordinary extractor that, uh, that we learn right now. And given... Uh, those seeds, the key features, or the features that have high, um, you know, 
uh, high weights on them. After we learn an extractor right now, what we can do is you know, pop them into an interface and then use them, basically do a bunch of matrix multiplies by these lists to come up with the right lists that have the most uh, important information going forward. So this is something that we're working on right now and hope to have results on uh, quite shortly. Um, so that's it. Uh, thank you guys for, for coming. Look forward to, to questions. And again, let me thank um, all, the, all the people who worked on this. Uh, and again, especially um, uh, Fei Wu, who built the, the base Kylin system. Raphael Hoffman, who's been, who did the sort of uh, bootstrapping to the web and is doing the new extraction. Um, uh, Steph Schoenmakers, who did the work on inference. And everybody did something interesting there. So happy to tell you more. Thanks very much. Yeah. On this last uh, thing that we talked about, uh, there's, some, there's been some work by a couple people uh, on automatic, using automatically clusters to automatically generate clusters by the lists to produce more general features. Uh, and that has had some success. Yeah, well, well I, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, What's there's some stuff that Scott Miller and then with these go, you, and then more recently Michael Collins and Stuart. IP use some of the things with parts and very successfully. So basically, they, they do a cooperative clustering based on between. Huh. And they don't, and uh, they, they do have some uh, some nice results. So it might be worth comparing with their stuff. Do you know where the Collins paper appeared? Yeah, probably ACL or something like that uh, this year or last year or something. You know, just kind of very recent. But uh, it's, it's based on some early work that uh, is uh, spot the work. Um, Thanks. I'll check for that. That's yeah, a good, good tip. I, mean, I, I like the way that you propose it. I, I sort of like that. But, uh, be good to compare Great. Thanks. Any other questions? Great. Well, I look forward to talking to you offline. Thanks again. Thank you.